Um, but that's not going to usually happen during the test. And even if I had the lights like this, that wouldn't happen during the exam because your level of arousal would be a little bit higher and you can focus and all that. So, you know, a certain amount of stress is actually a good thing. And the, the, the key is finding that balance or finding that level of stress that works for you. Um, you know, there are good sources of stress, and when you think about stress, any kind of change. So, what are some good things that happen in our lives that may be considered stressful? My daughter's getting married, and that's stressful, but yeah, the it's outcome will be good. Yeah, As he, I mean, it's a huge stressor to get married or to be, you know, engaged, to be involved in, a, in the preparation for a marriage. The transition, the family transition that you're undergoing, all of that is stressful. Having a baby, you know, is uh, super stressful. You know, going from two to three, but it's also marvelous. So stress again, you know, like stress is not necessarily a bad thing. And then if you have too low stress in a situation or in your life, then that could actually result in really low levels of arousal, and you're just kind of underwhelmed by everything or bored. Too much stress can cause all sorts of things, and I'll talk about them in more detail. Um, you know, just too high a level of anxiety, and then all sorts of physiological and behavioral symptoms that can go with it and interfere with your ability to do well on anything from taking a test to, you know, doing more complicated things in your life. So in psychology, we look at um, what's called the general adaptation syndrome, or the GAS. It's called the, the GAS. And it's a three-stage process to um, stress. So you look at the first stage, which is the alarm reaction. And um, I'll share with you a goofy little story from when I was a kid. Um, I was, it was Halloween, and uh, we like, you know, kids, we didn't have like cell phones and things back then, so we had to come up with other more mundane ways to entertain ourselves. And being kids, we thought we were very clever about the fact that adults might think ahead. You know, kids are not very good at that. So we're playing Ding Dong Ditch. Okay. And we're going along this, this street, we're playing Ding Dong Ditch. And uh, sure enough, the adults had called ahead and said, hey, these kids are coming around. Be prepared. And so some guy decided to hide in the bushes, waiting for us. And when we got to that approach, near that house, dark, and this guy jumps out of the bushes scared the I mean just you would not believe I've never run so fast in my life I ran like a cheetah right you know or I ran like a gazelle being chased by a cheetah right and so and that's that fight or flight response I mean that's exactly what happened I really I took off running did I think about what I was doing not at all it, and was you know like there's just no awareness of what's going on around you. It is just a whew, an instinctive, and your adrenaline is pumping, and you have all this energy, and you're just like go go go, and your heart is racing, right? And all of all of the things that happen when you have that alarm reaction. And was it helpful to me in the situation? Yeah, I mean it got me out of what I considered initial danger, you know, where the cheetah was going to pounce on me, so I had to save myself. Um, now, if I were, could, could I continue like this? No, right? You know, I mean, you just can't. Um, oops, I didn't mean to go that far. So then we took, we look at stage two, right? So if this is called adaptation, and if the stress continues, you'll find that. You know, the body will adapt under, to a certain extent. It will do its, it, the, the body will do its best to survive, essentially. And so if you look at like a case of starvation, if you are, if you are malnourished and you're not getting enough nutrition, your body will continue for a time to um, exist under these subpar uh, conditions, right? So the person would experience um, maybe a reduced desire for physical activity in order to conserve energy. Okay, but are we, are we could, again? Could we continue like this forever? Could you continue with that lower standard? And what's going to happen eventually? You're going to drop, right? I mean, eventually, there's nothing left. 
right? And, and I think a lot of us experience this, especially working in this kind of an environment when we have, uh, when we have this semester environment. And we start off the semester, and it's sort of an alarm stage, right? Because it's, but it's like the positive one. It's that energized, we're energized, we're ready to start, and we have all that energy, and we're kind of like going, going, going. And then we get into that second stage, which is that resistance stage. That happens, I see this with a lot of students, and I see it with myself too, that somewhere kind of mid-semester, you know, we're like going, 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 but we don't quite have that same level of energy, but we can't really, in our minds, afford to, to drop. Right? Because we still have the same number of commitments. And then what happens at the end of the semester with, you know, with so many students, especially, you get to the end and then it's just like people are just dropping with colds and flu and, you know, all, or just exhaustion and sickness and all sorts of things. And a lot of that is because of this, this process. You know, you've just been going so hard and for so long and your body just kind of gives out. So stage three, exhaustion, the stress persists for a long time. Your um, immune system may be compromised, body resistance compromised. And then, you know, if you look at people who are really experiencing long-term chronic stress, so we are not designed to be like a gazelle being chased by a cheetah all the time, all the time, all the time. But a lot of us tend to live in that kind of an environment. Modern, uh, modern society kind of sets us up for that type of environment. And so what you see then for long-term chronic stress is that impact with heart attacks, you know, reduced immunity, and so you're more exposed to infections, chronic pain, chronic illness, and um, all sorts of the you know, woes of modern society that we have. All right, so looking at some of the physical symptoms, for um, short-term stress, and if um, who likes to talk in front of crowds? It does bother me. Doesn't bother you. <laughs> How about you? Somehow I think you're probably not yeah. as comfortable with it. And so if I, even even probably in here, like this little one, if I asked you to come up in front and you know, what kinds of things do you experience? Or heart starts to raise. Get a little right. You get all of these. Those are those short-term physiological reactions to stress, right? Dry mouth, cool skin, cold hand and feet. Um, some people, you know, will actually feel kind of sick to their stomach. Uh, the, that feeling of butterflies. Uh, and this is coming from the um, coming from the autonomic nervous system. And here's how it, you know, the impact that it has is, you know, impact on your brain, impact on your skin muscle and joints, heart, stomach, pancreas, intestines, reproductive system, and immune system. Okay. So short-term effects of stress. Now long-term physical symptoms of stress, now you start to see, you know, I think some of the more common complaints that we hear about with a lot of people just in society overall. Insomnia, that's a significant problem. In, uh, in our society. I mean, I hear, I talk about sleep and dreams and, you know, stuff in Psych 200, and I, I'm, I'm always astonished by the number of students who just accept insomnia as a, as a way of life. It's like, oh yeah, I have insomnia. I'm 18 and I have insomnia and that's just the way it is. You know, and oh yeah, you get used to it. No, you don't get used to it. You don't, eventually, you're, something's gonna happen. You're gonna get sick or, you know, you're just gonna, you're gonna break. Your body's gonna break down. Uh, appetite changes, sexual disorders, physical pain, compromised immune system, right? Ch you know, chronic fatigue, uh, big problem. We don't want to see this. And then there are some behavioral symptoms of stress. Wait, this slide. Are stressed. He's yawning. Yeah. <laughs> the power of <laughs> suggestion. Uh, when dogs are stressed, they yawn. Yeah. Uh, when you put them like in a car or you're doing something, and they're kind of when they have that high level of um, alertness.
awkwardness and they're stressed out, they'll start yawning a whole bunch. And that's a sign of stress. And we do it too. It's just talking too fast, like I probably am right now. Uh, <laughs> talking too loud sometimes, fiddling, twitching, you know, nail biting, a lot of nail biters in our society. Um, and then you can start to see some of the more extreme, you know, irritability and, and irrational behavior sometimes from that come from just like chronic prolonged stress. And it, it puts us in positions where we're not as good at making sound decisions as we would be if we were in a calm and relaxed state of mind. You know, finding that optimal level of arousal that works for us. Fear is the path. If I could only do Yoda's voice. Fear is the path to the dark side. Fear leads to anger. Anger leads to hate. Hate leads to suffering. So this idea that like prolonged anger, prolonged anxiety is going to lead to all sorts of suffering, physiological suffering, relationship suffering, behavioral suffering, you name it. So what are some stressors for you? What's at the top of your list? Family. Tests. Tests. What did you say? Family. Family. positive ones. 
um, just a nice um, bath with tons of bubbles. <laughs> um, it's some sort of guided visualization. Just go for a walk, even if you don't feel like it. And I, I am, uh, I am right in the middle of this right now with the cold. Uh, the cold this this season is just bugging me more than it ever has. I don't know why. I have two dogs. My dogs are desperate to be walked every day. When I go for a walk with them, not only do they feel better, but I feel better. I always do. It's the same thing with yoga, the same thing with dance. If I do it, I always feel better. But sometimes you get caught in that it's too cold. I don't want to go outside. I don't want to get in the car. I just want to sit here. I just, you know, I mean, we, we, we do this to ourselves. And it's amazing if you, uh, like tonight I have obedience school at 8 o'clock, and it's going to be cold. It's, I feel like it's the last thing I want to do. But every time I go, I have a great time, and my dog has a great time. And we always come back at the end of that feeling like that was really worthwhile. I didn't think about school. I didn't think about work. Go to sleep and have a great night's sleep. Listening to music, watch a movie, meditate. The thing is, and, and these are just some things, you know, the thing is to find a healthy escape activity. Because there are a whole bunch of unhealthy escape activities. And young people are, are I think college students are particularly susceptible to a lot of these unhealthy escape activities that are available to us. Now here's another one, you know, that I think is so important is time management. Um, so Eric, I'm just curious, are, do you work on top of being a student? Very little. Very little. I'm your perfect example of being way too stressed. I have the chronic illness after things you just said there. Yeah. But you're not working, you're you're going to school but not you don't have work hours that you're trying to balance as well. No. That's good. That, that's a good thing. It's more if a friend needs help with something, mm -hmm. it's just a few hours. It's not a set schedule. Okay. So a few hours here, a few hours there, and then next thing you know, the day is gone, the week is gone, and things kind of pile, pile up. Yeah. I mean, time management is difficult for for everybody. Students, faculty, staff, we have multiple demands, we have multiple responsibilities. Um, I know I feel like this all the time. I feel like there should be three of me. So how, you know, what, what can we do? What can we do to try, we get, we get 24 hours in a day. You can't change that. And there's only one of us in those 24 hours. You can't change that either. So what can you change? And that's that's the thing to focus on. What could you change in that 24 hour period to make you feel less frantic? So for students, I think especially, you know, making a list of essential tasks Beginning of the semester, I, um, I, I, I spent part of my first day actually just talking about this and about how we learn and how, uh, how, our, how our brains work and the importance of spacing. And I, I'm always, I always show, I mean, we all carry these things around, right? Which I know in, in some respects is considered to be more stressful. But it's a tool, and it just depends on how you use the tool. If you use it for escapism and you're spending tons of time on it and it's interfering with the rest of, with other things that you need to get done, then that's stress-inducing. But if you use it as a time management tool, like a calendar that keeps you on task you know, every day, then that's really helpful. You know, so for students, what I say is, or I suggest, is I, at least in my class, I give you everything that you need for the semester. Every due date, any assignment, any test, if you know everything that there is for the entire semester. Put it all into a calendar and everything else that's in your semester as well. 
that's the only way we got through an accreditation visit, right? Is that you know we had to have okay, we know what's due by this date, and then what are the smaller tasks that you need in order to get to that place? And if you can keep yourself on some sort of a calendar, that eliminates the last minute rush to finalize a document, to study for an exam, to um, do a paper, to you know whatever whatever it is. And the last minute stuff, it's always a sloppy, it's not only stressful, but it's a sloppy way to do it. So, and tends not to be our best performance. So make a list of essential tasks. You know, what's important? That, I think that's another thing that a lot of us struggle with. I know I struggle with. Is cleaning my house important to my survival? To what you know, like to what level of, of, of cleanliness? You know, so you can maybe have all right. If it's too, if it's too messed up, then it just makes me irritated, and so that's going to increase my stress. But can I learn to let some things go, and then find a time when you know, then I can go ahead and just tackle it, and then it's done. In order to find, you know, the prior to focus on the priorities, which is to make sure that I get enough sleep. Students that sleep four hours a night. I heard students in the hallway yesterday bragging about how they're surviving on two hours of sleep per night. They're like competing with each other. Well, I only get two hours of sleep per night, not doing just fine. Like, no, you're not. <laughs> you're just not. You know, so when we look at the things that we want to eliminate, if I'm going to have to choose between cleaning the house or getting enough sleep, which one should I focus on? Sleep. Sleep, right? Um, and I think if all of us look at our schedules, if we really look at our schedules and look at the things that we do throughout the day, because that's one of the complaints that a lot of students have is, well, I just don't have enough time. Okay, but do you have an extra 10 minutes in the day that you can carve out? Maybe for um, some physical exercise. Just 10 minutes. Could you find 10 minutes in your day right now? I'm asking. Could you find 15 minutes? What? Do you Could you eliminate something? Or would you have to eliminate something? Cooking. <laughs> it's not one. I don't like it either. <laughs> Yeah, so I mean, so cooking, I mean, that's a big source of stress for um, a lot of people, being able to, you know, having to put food on the table. It's a big source of stress for me. Can't stand it. Shopping, <laughs> cooking, right? So, um, um, organization is so, is so essential because if you don't have it, like I don't right now, you're constantly like running to, okay, what am I gonna have? What are we gonna have today? Okay, I gotta cook it, I gotta do this. But if if I could get myself into a place where three times a week, you know, I make something for the for the family and then you know, like there are ways to organize yourself where you you have your staples, you shop and you keep your list, it's always the same, and so you keep that just replenished. When you run out, you put it on your list and then you go to the grocery store once a week and you know, fill it, up, fill it all back up. I mean, there are ways to do it. It, it just requires that kind of attention to, um, to planning it. And getting yourself into the habit of doing it, too. I think that's a big, um, it, starting it can seem overwhelming, can seem very stressful, but once you get into the cycle of it, then it's, it's different. Um, with studying, you know, understanding how our brains work, this idea of cramming or spending, you know, like getting all-nighters is, um, it, it's so contrary, it, it's completely contrary to how we learn. Uh, and I, you cannot really focus more than 30 or 40 minutes at a time. So spend 30 minutes and then get up. And, and there's, you know, find 10 minutes to do something different, whether it's you go watch like, a short TV show, or you listen to some music, or you walk outside for 10 minutes, or you, you do the 30-day plank challenge, or 
I mean, it, you know, it doesn't matter what it is, but take some time and stand up. Move around. And spacing is so important, whether it's studying for classes or getting tasks done, you know, for HSS or for SACS or for, you know, any of the administrative offices on campus. Doing small bits at a time is always more productive is more, I don't know, satisfying, satisfying kind of to the soul as well. Um, physical relaxation from physical activity. And so this is something that, again, I mean, I know this from an educational perspective. I know this from a personal perspective. If you get yourself doing something physical, you will feel better. I, it's guaranteed. <laughs> um, but the thing that's really the, the thing that's crucial is to find the activity that works for you or different activities that works for you. You know, I like horses. I like different. You know, I like yoga. Sometimes, <laughs> sometimes I get tired of yoga. Um, I don't like running. I hate running. So I'm never going to run. Because it's because it's stressful, you know. Like, and I tried it once. I said, "All right, I'm walking. I need to, I need to bump it up. I need to start running." And so I started running, and then I just thought, "This is stupid. Why am I doing this? I don't enjoy it. I find it to be painful, and um, so I'm not going to do it." So the, you know, the trick is is to find something physical that you like to do, and a good way to do that is to make it something that's social. And that's why I actually switched from doing yoga to doing dance. Um, because I like the music. I, I, it's not dance, I do cardio funk um, at the YMCA. And I just like the music and I like to move to the music and I, I forget everything for the 50 minutes or whatever period of time that I'm doing that. And I like that social activity. It's not one where I have to talk to anybody, but I get to kind of hang out with people who like to do this same activity, you know, and it's an opportunity to just kind of check in and say, hey, how's it going? You know, and you dance side by side, and you're all kind of laughing, and it's a great social experience. Whereas um, yoga started to turn into too much of a in-my-head experience, and I love yoga, but I got tired of that in-my-head experience, and the dance t takes me outside of my head. If you like to walk, but you feel like, oh, I don't want to walk by myself, I don't want to walk my dog by myself. Find somebody else that likes to do it and turn it into an opportunity not only to walk, but to catch up with a friend. And it makes a huge difference in the likelihood that you're going to actually engage in something. I know that the college has tried to do things in the past. There have been some challenges coming from human resources. And for a while, we used to see people um, walking around Merritt Hall. Mm -hmm. And they would do it in partners. Um, Eleanor used to do it. Eleanor and Andrew, so mm -hmm. Helen, yeah. yeah, and she would, but she always did it with somebody. It was always a pair of them, and they would um, easily do two miles. You know, walking around Merritt. If it was a nice day, they would walk the perimeter of the campus. Sometimes it's just changing uh, where you park. You know, like the Dr. Sparhawk with Tom does. He parks as far away from campus as he possibly can. When you um, Eric, when you drive out, if you drive out on uh, to, on uh, to Ford's Ferry. Ford's Ferry Road, and so that lot that's there, and there's always there's a little uh, Volkswagen that's the furthest spot away from campus, and that's our sociology professor, Dr. Sparhawk, and he just started doing that a couple of years ago because he realized that if he could, you know, that's like how do I find extra time in my day? So he found that time. Just going to extend my walk every morning, and that started to increase his physical activity. And then he started to find other little pockets throughout the day. Because that's another thing I think that people have a tendency to do. We see this. We see this at the YMCA. Oh, January, and it is packed in there. You cannot move through the hallways of the YMCA. February, it starts to thin. By March, you're right back down to the average numbers. People, they get, they, they set these goals, like, I'm going to do it, you know, and, and 
and then um, and then they get tired or they slip one time and then they're like, oh, forget it. You know, I guess I guess I'm not meant for it or I just can't do it. So finding something that you enjoy and setting realistic goals you know, for yourself. Self care. I mean, I just cannot stress this enough, and I. If for students, I cannot stress this enough. Adequate sleep. To sleep for two hours a night, to sleep for four hours a night. What's the impact on that for us physically? What does that do to us? Just exhaust your body. Yeah. So what does that do to your immune system? So you're totally broken down. You're vulnerable to colds and flu and all this stuff that's going around right now. And what about in terms of like learning and memory? Can you? You can't. You just you like your brain. We process memories when we sleep. Sleeping is an active part of learning. So to cram and to not sleep in order to try to do well on your test is is it's counterproductive. Now I recognize that not everybody can get eight hours of sleep, especially if you with students that are working and, um, and going to school. But I also know that people have a lot of personal habits that interfere with their sleep. Have you ever heard the term sleep hygiene? Sleep that there is, just like physical hygiene, you know, like there are certain things that, you know, we should, we should kind of do on a regular basis to keep our bodies in, you know, in good shape. Well, sleep hygiene is paying attention to your environment What's a good environment for sleep? To try to ensure as best you can that insomnia is not going to be a problem for you, that you're able to fall asleep and that you're also able to stay asleep for a period of time. So what are some things that you can do? Well, you can also sit on your TV in your room. Yeah. You shouldn't have any, really, like any electronics in the bedroom. Um, now, I, I keep this in my bedroom but I have it sit because I use this for an alarm. Uh, but I have it. It's I have it set to 10 o'clock or 9:30 at night. It goes to an automatic, uh, you know, nobody can reach me mode. Mm -hmm. So I don't get any beeps or lights or anything. This thing is dead between 10 p.m. and 5:45 a.m. when the alarm goes off. Unless I pick it up and go to look at it to check the time, but I don't get any interruptions from it. So I think again, you know, it's like it's a tool. It depends on how you use it. But to, in general, technology should be out of the bedroom. Um, I was just talking with some students the other day about this, and the student said, "Well, I use the TV for background." And this is a student who has terrible insomnia, and she says she cannot sleep unless the TV is because it's the background noise, right? So what, you know, what could you do instead of having the TV in there? Yeah, you could have a fan, you could have music, you could have books on tape, you know, because some people like that audio going on, but it's the light that comes from the screen and it, it, it'll disrupt your, um, your sleep rhythms. Yeah, and I know there's some research that's coming out that that's been coming out that you shouldn't even be looking at like e-readers before you go to sleep. You should be looking at paper books. The, that artificial light that's coming out is interfering with our internal clocks and makes it more difficult to fall asleep. Right. So these are the types of things that you know what um, psychologists mean by sleep hygiene. Um, don't exercise at 10 o'clock at night because what happens when you exercise? Yeah, it energizes you, right? And it's gonna take several hours for your body to get to the point where it's ready to, okay, I'm ready to go to sleep. So, you know, some people at early evening will work. Um, earlier in the day is even better, if you can do that. Um, caffeine, at what point in the day should you, if you do drink caffeine, when should you stop? I have to stop at day. Okay. Oh, yeah. And so, I mean, three o'clock, four o'clock is really that's that's the cutoff. And at, after that, you should not be having any caffeine, or it's going to interfere. Um, balanced diet, another big problem.
problem for all of us. You know, we're on the run, we're, there's a lot of crappy food that's very easily available. It's right here on campus, <laughs> which I wish we would do something about. Um, you know, fi finding ways to ensure that you're getting the, that, that you're getting the nutrients that you need, that you're eating somewhat of a balanced diet. Living off of ramen noodles, is, or living off of our, whatever's offered here. Um, hydration, hugely important. And it's one that, you know, all of us are guilty of not doing a good job of. And hydration with what? Yeah, I mean, really, you know, it's with water. Now, it's true you can ha you can have too much water if you like engage in some weird sort of chugging contest with water, you know, and you drink like I don't know however many gallons all at once. Then your body's not going to really like that. But the, the rule of thumb with with hydration is if you if you feel thirsty, then you've gone too far. Right? You should if you feel thirsty, you're dehydrated. If you carry a bottle of water around with you and you drink it regular intervals throughout the day, then that helps keep your body well hydrated. Other, you know, other drinks like a lot of the caffeinated drinks, they're going to actually end up dehydrating you. Yeah, well hydrated. And then, you know, I put here monitor caffeine, monitor sugar, alcohol, and nicotine. I, I'd like to say eliminate. <laughs> Uh, but that's, I know that's not possible for everybody. Um, and sugar is a tough one. I've worked with the sugar one before. Um, I try to pay attention to it, but man, sugar is everything. Uh, and you can stress yourself out over trying to eliminate sugar from your diet, which is part of the reason why I started eating going to the grocery store, is I started looking at labels. And then I got to a point where I look at, so much, I look at labels so much that I hate to buy food. So you could just drive yourself crazy with it. Um, really, what are, you, what are you looking for is moderation um, in, in everything. So a little bit of sugar, you know, is fine. But like I had a student who drank, uh, this was many, many years ago, and he would come into class and he'd have a, a liter, is that, are they liter, those bottles, big bottles? Two, two, two liters. liters? A two liter bottle of, um, of uh, Dr. Pepper. And he just carried it around school with him. Um, you know, alcohol in moderation, and you know, uh, also thinking about the, t the, the time of day, so very late at night, that's going to interfere with your um, circadian rhythms, it's going to interfere with your sleep cycle. Um, nicotine, just don't do it, just don't smoke. Um, breathing exercises, so this is something that we do a lot in yoga, and um, Yoga is yoga is very interesting. A lot of a lot of us think about yoga as the physical exercise of yoga, right? When you do your downward facing dog, you can do all these weird stretchy things. Um, but that's only really one piece of yoga. Underlying everything we do in yoga, it's it's all about the breath. It's all about learning how to breathe, and learning how to breathe, and paying attention to your breath, particularly in times when you're feeling stress. You're feeling anxiety can help you reduce those levels of anxiety. So, and it's as simple as just paying attention to your breath. You don't have to do anything fancy. You don't have to do any like fancy yoga breaths where you have to breathe through your nose and make weird sounds and stuff like that. But just simply taking a deep breath and slowly exhaling the, you know, as much as you inhaled, and doing that several cycles. If you did that for five or six times in a row, that's going to calm the autonomic nervous system. That's going to bring the heart rate down. That's going to decrease the levels of anxiety. And so, you know, for testing, that's a really good thing to, to do. I saw you were nodding your head about test anxiety, right? feeling nervous before exams. So if you know that that's something that happens to you, and you go and you sit down at the exam, 
And before you even started, take five deep breaths. Help your body calm itself down. And then tackle the first question. And if you feel that anxiety coming back in, try to back off of it again and take another couple of deep breaths. It's a really simple strategy that can be very effective. Even 10 minutes of rest, you know, just somewhere throughout the day. You, you don't have an office. So that's part of where I think a lot of your stress can come from, is you can't get away from us. <laughs> you have to always be there. You're there for the phone. You're there for anybody who walks in, and things change just like that. Um, so you know, in your case, you need, to, you need to walk away from that area and find another spot to eat your lunch or to go for a walk or something. Know, and, and something that's just for you, not that's not for HSS and not you know not for all of us that have so many demands on you. I think you have an office, right? So you can close your door. Yeah. Right? <laughs> yeah. I can close my door too. Like, <laughs> leave me alone. Um, Ten minutes can make uh, make a big difference. Just go someplace, sit quietly, close your eyes. Regroup. And again, it's that question, can you find 10 minutes in your day that you can reclaim just for yourself? I think, you know, and I think anybody can do that. Social support, right? All of us feel, all of us, myself included, when you get into these ruts or you get into high, high stress levels or the holidays or the winter blues or whatever it is that's going on, we, we all feel like we're all alone with it. But the reality is, of course, we're not. Lots of people are experiencing the same difficulties in life that we are. So somehow finding a way to reach out and get some social support, spending some time with others. We have resources here at the school. Um, we don't have as good of resources as I would like us to have. We don't have counselors that you know deal with mental health, but we do have counselors that are here. Um, we have faculty that are here that I think could be a wonderful source. I love having students come in and chat with me about whatever. I think a lot of faculty. I can't speak for all, probably not all faculty, but lots of faculty do do enjoy it. And that can be a really great source of social connection for students on campus. It's something that the community college really lacks. Students are kind of, you know, being a commuter campus, it's hard for students to make that connection with faculty that you get at a four year when you're on campus and you're supposed to build those relationships. So, so there's some things that you can do. And then the last thing is to challenge negative Um, this is just one statement. Like this is an example of negative thoughts. What happened? This is a you know that glass half empty, glass half full. However you look at the world, not neither way is, is better or worse. Um, I'm not I'm not uh, promoting uh, constant optimism because that can actually be stressful. Like if somebody's always like I'm the kind of person that I tend to be. Um, even I'm not a super joyful person. And I, I will have people um, sometimes stop me on the street or say something, they'll look at me and they're like, smile. You know, like somehow they think I'm, I'm depressed. And I'm not depressed. It's just who I am. I'm kind of a more, I don't know, that's how I, how I present. And so for people to tell me to try to uplift myself is actually stressful. Because I'm actually pretty happy. It's just that's how I approach the world. Other people are way up here. It, you know, if you're depressed, that's, you know, if you're dealing with depression, that's a little different. So half empty, half full, it just depends on your perspective. Um, but this idea of negative thinking, th this is a, a rationale for depression. And if you've ever heard of cognitive behavioral therapy, this actually tackles um, the negative thoughts that people will engage in. And 
strategies to try to pull yourself out of the cycle of negative thinking. So if you have like a very broad statement, which a lot of us tend to do, like, oh, I just cannot do this. Oh, I'm so alone, you know, or I have no friends, or some kind of blanket statement like that. Where can you punch a hole in that statement? Is there, uh, if you're feeling very isolated, can you challenge yourself to find a hole in that, like, I'm all, I'm all alone? Well, actually, you know, I do meet with this person, or I do talk with this person sometimes, and we have a pretty good relationship. Okay, boom, I just punched a hole in that statement there. So it's not a, so it's an incorrect statement. What happens with negative thinking, and, um, and this is a powerful model for how depression occurs, and certainly depression and anxiety you know, and stress, I mean, these are all rolled in together. You see, if you think about a day when you had a really bad day, things have just not gone well and you're tired, and somebody says something to you, it could be something you know, neutral, sort of neutral, it's not really positive, it's not necessarily negative, how are you more likely to interpret that statement? in a negative way, right? You know, and we're more sensitive to criticism and we're more likely to kind of react to things. And then, how does it make you feel? Right? You kind of feel worse, which makes you then more vulnerable to these statements, which makes you feel worse. And then, and this is the downward spiral into, um, for, for some people, is a downward spiral into depression. So, so therapies that are aimed at this are, you know, when we can break a hole in that negative thinking, then we can start to come out of that spiral and actually, you know, be on a more, more neutral or more positive ground. And so what, what you, you know, what you would have to do as individuals, if this is something that applies to you, is, you know, are, are there statements that you tend to throw on yourself, that you tend to blanket on yourself, and that become more, I don't know, apparent, or more controlling 